The U.S. Navy called it Operation Forager. This mammoth invasion, commonly known as the D-Day of the Pacific, involved 535 ships and 127,571 assault troops. Operation Forager proposed to liberate the Marianas Islands by reclaiming the U.S. territory of Guam and by occupying the nearby islands of Saipan and Tinian. The seizure of these islands formed the linchpin of Admiral Chester Nimitz's strategy in the Central Pacific. Once taken, these islands could serve as forward bases, giving the United States new options for the next stage of the Pacific War. With the Marianas under their control, U.S. forces could head south and liberate the Philippines, or they could move north through the Bonins and attack the Japanese home islands. Even more importantly, U.S. Army Air Forces could establish airfields in the Marianas from which they could launch long-range bombing missions over Japan. A prolonged bombing campaign could, in theory, soften up the home islands for invasion, or perhaps it could even win the war entirely on its own. In any event, the Marianas needed to be taken. Operation Forager was the plan to do it. To carry out this important operation, Admiral Nimitz selected the Navy's 5th Fleet, under command of Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance. While carrying members of the 27th Infantry Division and the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Marine Divisions, Spruance's fleet planned to encircle the islands, bombard the landing beaches, and then send in the assault troops. By late April 1944, all the details were set. Vice Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, the commander of 5th Fleet's amphibious ships, scheduled the first landing on Saipan to take place on June 15th. Departing from the Hawaiian Islands in early June 1944, 5th Fleet sallied forth. And by the 12th, Spruance's carrier planes began their aerial bombardment of Japanese shore defenses. Turner's amphibious forces landed on schedule, and with that, the two-month battle for the Marianas Islands commenced. As the Marines and Army infantry slogged their way inland, the U.S. Navy now had orders to repel anything the Japanese might do to disrupt the invasion. Unsurprisingly, Japanese naval commanders were eager to strike back. Back in the spring, Fleet Admiral Miniichi Koga devised Order 73, also known as Operation Ego, which envisioned a single decisive battle to change the momentum of the Pacific War. Order 73 did not specify a location for this battle, but it supposed that the Imperial Combined Fleet could counterattack in the midst of an American amphibious assault. Unfortunately for Admiral Koga, he never implemented his plan. On March 31st, he was killed when a seaplane in which he was traveling crashed in the middle of a typhoon. As soon as Koga's replacement, Admiral Soemu Toyota learned that Americans were coming ashore in the Marianas. He decided to dust off Order 73 and put it into effect. He called upon Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa's mobile force to set sail from Tawi Tawi and take out Spruance's 5th Fleet. Ozawa assembled a massive fleet of 62 ships and 24 submarines. On June 16th, Ozawa's ships exited through the San Bernardino and Surigao Straits. Several U.S. submarines on patrol detected these convoys and radioed the news of the impending Japanese arrival to Spruance's flagship, USS Indianapolis. Additionally, Direction Finding Technology at Pearl Harbor pinpointed a possible location for the Japanese task force after Ozawa broke radio silence to make contact with his air bases on Guam. Although he possessed accurate sighting reports, Spruance refused to order an immediate counterattack. Even though his carrier task force commander, Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher, proposed to sail west and bring the U.S. fleet in range of the Japanese by morning, Spruance denied him. He believed the entirety of the 5th Fleet needed to remain next to Saipan. Spruance later commented, It was of highest importance that our troops and transport forces on and in the vicinity of Saipan be protected, and a circling movement by enemy forces be guarded against. This decision later led to controversy. Mitcher commanded a large and capable force, the Fast Carrier Task Force. 
When it was attached to 5th Fleet, the Fast Carrier Task Force was called Task Force 58, and it consisted of 112 warships. Mitra believed his force could beat Ozawa's on its own, and when Spruance's orders arrived at Mitra's flagship, a great many officers assigned to Task Force 58 were beside themselves with anger, and accused Spruance of having no guts. Dutifully, Mitra adhered to his orders. Whether right or wrong, Spruance's decision made it clear that an epic battle would take place in the Philippine Sea, and that the Japanese would choose the time of first contact. For two days, June 19th and 20th, 1944, the fate of the Pacific War hung in the balance. In the following videos, you will hear the words of participants from the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Many of the veterans who fought there have since passed on, but before they died, they left behind vivid accounts of their experiences. Voice actors will read aloud their words to bring their recollections back to life. From them, we can learn what it was like to have witnessed one of the biggest naval air battles in world history. At 3 o'clock a.m. on June 19, 1944, one of the largest naval battles in world history, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, was underway. The two fleets, the American 5th Fleet and the Japanese Mobile Force, had drifted into air combat range of each other, but neither had yet located its opponent. The previous evening, a U.S. submarine, the Kavala, had stumbled into the Japanese carrier task force, but since then, it had lost contact. While awaiting Kavala to reacquire its target, the American carrier task force, Task Force 58, began sending search planes in a wide arc west of the Marianas Islands. They launched at 2 a.m., and after hours in the air, most of them found nothing. Finally, at 8.30, a sighting report issued by a PBM Mariner seaplane belatedly reached the cabin of Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance on his flagship, USS Indianapolis. The report was over seven hours old, and it placed the Japanese fleet beyond the range of the American carriers. Everyone assigned to Task Force 58 knew that in a carrier versus carrier battle, the side that struck first usually won. The Americans, it seems, had missed their crucial chance to strike that first blow. They had sighted the enemy fleet several times over the past 24 hours, but failed to react to the sighting reports with sufficient speed. On the other side, the Japanese fleet suffered no such problems. They knew exactly where to look to find their foes. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa ordered his land-based aircraft to launch from the Marianas Islands. He expected those pilots could easily spot the American fleet in the Philippine Sea and radio its position. That is exactly what happened. Prior to dawn, 50 Japanese planes launched from an airfield on Guam. At 5.50, 160 miles west of Saipan, a Mitsubishi A6M0 located Task Force 58. After sending his sighting report, this brave pilot attacked on his own. The gun crews of the destroyer USS Yarnell brought them down. No Americans were hurt, but the real damage had been done. Ozawa had been given the precise location of the U.S. carrier fleet. Immediately, the Japanese scrambled all of their remaining Guam-based aircraft. At 7.30, the American radar operators picked up a cloud of blips hovering over the island. Realizing that Task Force 58 was in trouble, its aggressive commander, Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher, dispatched his carrier-based fighter planes to Guam to interdict the Japanese before their airstrike got underway. 30 F-6F Hellcats rushed to the scene. In a swirling hour-long battle, the Japanese suffered heavily, losing 35 planes shot down. The Americans lost only one aircraft. Meanwhile, Ozawa's carrier-based aircraft were on their way. Ozawa sent out four waves of composite strikes, a mix of dive bombers, fighters, fighter bombers, and torpedo bombers, intermixing groups from different carriers. Altogether, Ozawa's fleet launched 373 of its 402 available aircraft. The Japanese hinged everything on delivering this knockout blow. At 10.07 a.m., when they were 45 miles out, American radar picked up the first wave of Japanese aircraft. 
With little deliberation, Vice Admiral Mitcher ordered every available fighter plane to get into the air and contribute to the defense of the task force. Inside the carrier islands, the fighter director officers assessed the radar reports and sent messages to the fighter pilots who were just then getting aloft, telling them where to go in order to batter the incoming Japanese planes. Ozawa's first wave did not get far. In only a few minutes, the Americans shot down 42 of 69 enemy aircraft. Only one Japanese dive bomber managed to penetrate the American fighter screen and get a hit on an American ship. A 500-pound bomb struck USS South Dakota, causing minor damage and killing 24 men. The second Japanese wave, which consisted of 129 aircraft, arrived after 11 o'clock a.m. Fighter control directors vectored more and more aircraft into the area. 25-year-old Lieutenant Alexander Verechu led a division of F-6F Hellcats from USS Lexington. Barely airborne, his Hellcat began showing signs of trouble. His engine began spitting oil onto the windshield, and it refused to operate at full power. Additionally, the deck crew had forgotten to lock the safety pins on his Hellcat's folding wings, which meant he could not risk putting his plane into a tight turn. Nevertheless, from an altitude of 20,000 feet, Verechu charged into the fray. At approximately 10.20, our group was launched. I heard the fighter director officer saying, Vector 250, climb to Angels 25, pronto. It was a running rendezvous on the climb. Spot gazing intently, I suddenly picked out a large, rambling mass of at least 50 enemy planes 2,000 feet below, port side and closing. My adrenaline flow hit high C. I remember thinking, this could develop into a once in a lifetime fighter pilot's dream. Giving a slight rock to my wings, I began a run on the nearest inboard straggler, a Judy dive bomber. I streaked underneath the formation, getting a good look at their planes for the first time. They were Judy's, Jill's, and Zero's. I radioed an amplified report. After pulling up and over, I picked out another Judy on the edge of the formation. It was doing some wild maneuvering, and the rear gunner was squirting away as I came down from the stern. I worked in close and gave him a burst. He caught fire quickly and headed down to the sea, trailing a long plume of smoke. Calling over the radio, Verechu gleefully declared, Scratch one Judy. With little ado, he changed direction and surged back into the Japanese formation. He narrated the next few harrowing minutes. I pulled up again and found two more Judies flying as loose wingmen. I came in from the rear, sending one down burning. Dipping my Hellcat's wing, I slid over on the one slightly ahead and got it on the same pass. It caught fire also, and I could see the rear gunner still peppering away at me as he disappeared in an increasingly sharp arc downward. For a split second, I almost felt sorry for the little bastard. That made three down, and now we were getting close to our fleet. The sky appeared to be full of smoke and pieces of planes, and we were trying to ride herd on the remaining attacking planes to keep them from scattering. Another meatball broke formation up ahead, and I slid over onto his tail, again working in close. I gave him a short burst, but it was enough. It went right into the sweet spot at the root of his wing tanks. The pilot or control cables must have been hit, because the burning plane twisted crazily, out of control. In spite of our efforts, the Jills were now beginning to descend to begin their torpedo runs, and the remaining Judies were at the point of peeling off to go down with their bombs. I headed for a group of three Judies in a long column. By the time I had reached the tail ender, we were almost over our outer screen of ships, but still fairly high. The first Judy was about to begin his dive, and as he started to nose over, I noticed black puffs beside him in the sky. Our five inches were beginning to open up. Foolishly, maybe, I overtook the nearest one. It seemed that I had barely touched the trigger, and his engine started coming to pieces. The Judy started smoking, then torching, alternately off and on, as it disappeared below. The next one was about one-fifth of the way down in his dive, appearing to be trying for one of the destroyers before I caught up with him. This time, a short burst produced astonishing results. He blew up with a tremendous explosion right in front of my face. I must have hit his bomb, I guess. I have seen planes blow up before, but never like this. I yanked the stick up sharply to avoid the scattered pieces and flying hot stuff, 
then radioed splash number six. Everywhere, other American pilots experienced tremendous luck and shot down the Japanese planes with impunity. Of 129 attacking aircraft, 98 were lost. As Verechu leveled out his Hellcat, he beheld the grim aftermath. Looking around at that point, only Hellcats seemed to be remaining in the sky. Glancing backward to where we had begun, in a pattern 35 miles long, there were flaming oil slicks in the water and smoke still hanging in the air. It didn't seem like just eight minutes. It seemed longer. But that's all it was. An eight-minute opportunity for the flight of a lifetime. In total, Vrechu used only 360 rounds of ammunition to claim his six kills before landing back aboard USS Lexington. When Verechu returned to the carrier, he spotted Vice Admiral Mitcher looking down from the island, and he proudly held up six fingers, presenting his score. Seeing Mitcher's smiling approval, a photographer captured the moment, producing the most famous photograph from the battle. Years later, an interviewer commented, I've seen that picture. You look like a very happy man holding up six fingers. Verechu replied, yes. I think everybody ended up with a lot of self-satisfaction that day. But the Japanese weren't finished. At 1 p.m., as some of the American planes began returning for more fuel and ammunition, a third wave, another 47 planes, came in and made an ineffective attack against USS Enterprise. Seven planes went down in flames, and the other 40 turned tail for home. As they retreated, these Japanese pilots bumped into the fourth wave, which had been struggling to find the American fleet because its leader had been given improper rendezvous coordinates. Some of the third wave planes joined up and led the fourth wave back to the American fleet. But before they could find it, the pilots in the fourth wave began to complain about their dwindling fuel gauges. So the flight broke up, and in small contingents, the pilots began heading for Guam. Before reaching their destination, American Hellcat pilots from four different carriers intercepted them. Once again, Japanese planes began falling fast out of the skies. Out of 82 planes in the fourth wave, only nine made it to safety. The colossal air battle finally subsided at dusk. The result had been rather one-sided. The Japanese lost a total of 303 aircraft. 220 from Ozawa's fleet, 60 land-based planes, and 23 seaplanes. By contrast, the Americans lost only 23 planes shot down and six others by accident. Only 27 American aviators had been killed during the entire day, while the Japanese counted their losses in the hundreds. In Fighting Squadron 16's ready room on USS Lexington, one pilot remarked that the operation had been just like an old-time turkey shoot. In that instant, June 19, 1944, received its moniker, the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Why did the Americans outperform their adversaries so spectacularly? Certainly, the accuracy of American radar and the quick thinking of the U.S. fighter director officers had much to do with it as did the capabilities of the Grumman F-6F Hellcat, the Navy's primary fighter interceptor. However, the determination, the marksmanship, and the piloting skills of the American fighter pilots proved to be the truly decisive factors. Alex Verechu got six kills on his own. But he was just one ace among many that day. The Japanese pilots stood no chance. Task Force 58, had stacked its deck with aces. It was an unbeatable hand. On the morning of June 21, 1944, the Battle of the Philippine Sea was over. The American fleet still held the waters off Saipan and the Japanese fleet was in retreat to Okinawa. For Japan, the battle had been a decisive defeat. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa's mobile force had lost three carriers and two oilers sunk and nearly 3,000 sailors and airmen killed in action or lost at sea. In the totality of the cost in Japanese machinery and human life, the battle had been almost as devastating as the defeat suffered at Midway two years earlier, when an additional carrier had been sunk and an equal number of men killed. 
Most unfortunately, at the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Japanese lost heavily in aviators and planes. In two days, they lost about 325 aircraft. A mix of land-based aircraft destroyed on the ground, carrier and land-based aircraft shot down by U.S. fighters and AA fire, and planes that went down with the carriers Taiho and Shokaku. With that destruction, as many as 640 aviators may have died, rendering Japanese naval air power all but impotent for the rest of the war. Although the Japanese continued to put their carriers out to sea, with only 108 planes available, they made only a token resistance against advancing American forces. The Japanese carriers participated in just one more engagement, the Battle of Cape Engano. After that, as a matter of strategy, the Japanese decided to introduce a new kind of aviator, the speedily trained kamikaze, the crash dive pilots. After the Battle of the Philippine Sea, one despondent aircraft carrier officer, Captain Ichiro Gio, believed that Japan's only success for victory was to follow a cruel arithmetic, trading one life in a suicide attack to ensure the sinking of an American ship. Right after Philippine Sea, Captain Gio declared, No longer can we hope to sink the numerically superior enemy aircraft carriers through ordinary methods. Of course, the story of the kamikaze is a tale for another day. For the U.S. Navy, the Battle of the Philippine Sea produced mixed results. Comparatively, the U.S. Fifth Fleet suffered far fewer losses than the Japanese. Not a single ship had been sunk and only 109 sailors and airmen had perished. But the pilots from Task Force 58 believed they could have accomplished more than they did. Although they had savaged the Japanese airstrike during the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot on June 19th, the limited success of the Mission Beyond Darkness on June 20th disappointed them. Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher spoke for many when he declared, The enemy escaped. He had been hurt badly by one aggressive carrier strike at the one time he was within range, but his fleet was not sunk. Much of the blame for the imperfect victory fell upon Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance, the overall commander of Operation Forager. To many, he appeared to lose his nerve at the precise moment the fleet required an aggressive command decision. On the night of June 18th, when contact reports placed the Japanese mobile force within 355 miles of the American fleet, Spruance balked at the chance to strike. Rather than close the distance over the nighttime hours so that Task Force 58 could be ready to launch at dawn, Spruance insisted that his carriers stay on patrol in the waters near Saipan. This decision to stay put and forfeit the first attack to the enemy greatly incensed the aircraft carrier officers. Lieutenant Alex Wildean, an intelligence officer assigned to USS Yorktown, wrote in his diary, The Navy brass turned yellow. No fight. No guts. Spruance branded every Navy man in Task Force 58 a coward tonight. I hope historians fry him in oil. Immediately after the battle, when word of Spruance's caution became public, Admiral John Towers, Nimitz's deputy commander, demanded that Spruance be relieved. Nimitz denied Towers' request. Spruance's critics had a point, but so did Spruance. He believed he could not abandon his amphibious forces to go hunting the Japanese carrier fleet when the success of the invasion of the Marianas Islands was so uncertain. The fighting on Guam, Saipan, and Tinian lasted much longer than planners anticipated, and it resulted in more than 8,120 American lives lost. In the end, the seizure of the Marianas had an important result. Over the autumn of 1944, Navy construction battalions completed airfields on these islands capable of housing hundreds of Boeing B-29 superfortresses. From these bases, American planes began bombing targets in the Philippines, in the Ryukyu Islands, and on mainland Japan. Planes involved in the infamous firebombing of Tokyo and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki took off from bases in the Marianas. If it must be concluded that the Pacific War ended when the U.S. Army Air Force delivered its knockout blows from the air, then it must also be admitted that the American victory could not have happened until U.S. forces had taken the Marianas Islands. 
Thus, the action of the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet was pivotal to the story of America's final success, and the Battle of the Philippine Sea determined which side, the United States or Japan, kept those islands. Undeniably, during those two days in June 1944, the fate of the war was decided. <laughs>